G'day and welcome to the XJet channel. Now I've cleared my bench a bit today, just for a moment, been building a whole lot of mini quads drones and other stuff for my RC model reviews channel, but as regular people know, I'm just about to revamp the XJet channel, put a lot more content on it because uh, it's a channel that's a little bit more eclectic in nature, it has a lot of different things, and I'm going to try and revitalize it. It's sadly lacked because I haven't been able to fly, so I'm going to bring in some cool technology engineering type videos now and hopefully make this channel a lot more fun and have a lot more reason to watch the videos regularly. So what I've got here is my good old TIG welder. Now this welder, um, I bought it quite a few years ago, about 2009 I think I bought it, maybe before that. And it has served me pretty well for, well it did for about three or four years. Never really pushed it very hard. It's a 200 amp welder, but it was mainly used for welding the thin stainless steel for post jets. So typically it was running at 30 to 50 amps, not very much at all. And so I was a bit disappointed when the damn thing up and died on me, <laughs> considering that in total it's probably had no more than 50 hours of use, 50 hours of welding use, and then pff, it's dead. So yeah, not impressed. Now it is a cheap Chinese model, so it could be a house of horrors when we get in here, but let's take the lid off and we'll do a bit of a tear down and see what's what's inside and whether it's even worth repairing now. Knowing that this was a cheap Chinese welder, I have actually bought another one. I bought one a couple of years ago. I haven't even taken out of the box yet. So we'll do an unboxing on that and I'll show you how to set up a TIG welder to do welding of um, ordinary steel, stainless steel and aluminium or aluminium if you live in America, where well, you can't get aluminium over there apparently. It's restricted, you have to use aluminium. So I'm gonna do that, I'll, we'll pull this down, we'll have a look inside, see how clever the little Chinese ladies' hands have been when they've been putting this together and what sort of horrors lie within. Let's rip it apart, come on. Where's my screwdriver? Let's go. No, I thought something bigger than that. Never mind. I'll cut to the chase now, to the inside bits. Okay, I've edited out the boring bits. Suffice to say, a small mountain of screws later, some of which were cross-threaded. Oh, um, I have taken out, I think, all the screws I need to, to rip this top cover off. So let's have a look. Whoa, here we go. Or oh, do we? Let's hold that on. I think I have to spread it as well. There we go. So here's all the juicy goodness inside. Cheap Chinese welder. Let's have a look. Ooh, isn't there a mountain of stuff in here? My goodness, let's start taking a close. Ooh, I'm shuddering already. Let's take a closer look. See what is buried inside this thing. Okay, there you go. We've got the panels off there. Look at it. Now, before I go any further, I've got to say, because obviously, um, Anything like this can be potentially lethal. And this has been turned off for quite a few months. Otherwise, I'd be very cautious about what I was doing in here because inside here there are capacitors, devices that can hold an electrical charge for quite some time. So even when it's unplugged, you could still get a nasty whack or even kill yourself playing around on the insides of something like this. So do not try this at home and uh, just pay attention because, you know, as I say, it could be quite dangerous to do this. That's why I do it. I do it so you don't have to. And I'll be killed instead of you. Right, let's take a bit of a look inside here. And you can see there's an awful lot going on here. There is a hell of a lot going on here. In fact, I'm quite amazed at how much stuff they've put in this welder. So let's have some close looks at, at the various bits and pieces and see what I can find. Now here in all its glory is the main board. And my God, what a board it is. Look how much crap they've got on this thing. This is unbelievable. Now, there is, this is, it's dated 2006. The circuit board's got a, a design date of 2006, but honestly, this looks as if it's something that would have been made in the early 90s, late 80s even, because there's just so much discrete circuitry. There's none of those great big, you know, 40 or uh, 48 pin packages that you expect to see in modern electronics. No, nah, the biggest we get is a 14 pin dual in line package like this one here. This is old school and it's all through hole. That means the stuff isn't soldered to the top, it's actually been pushed through holes in the board and soldered from underneath. So this is a very, very old school piece of gear. I, you know, I'm surprised that something designed in 2006 wouldn't have surface mount components and a much more integrated design. So let's see how well I've thought this through from an engineering and an electronic design perspective. I've had to spin it around a bit to get a view of the first thing that screams bad design. And I'm sure you can see it. Look at this, this transistor here, and it's got a bodge wire over here to a resistor coming off the circuit board and then over here there's another wire and around the back here where we can't even see there's another wire goes off to this goes off to the board down here um, why I mean my god this is a transistor and a resistor how could you possibly forget to put those on the main board when you were designing it I suspect that when they've designed it it hasn't worked as well as that hoped so they've had to come in and make some changes now that's not unknown in the electronics game sometimes even the best people slip up and even the top quality gear you know like from Hewlett Packard or sorry what is it now 
was Agilent and now it's something else, Keysight, all the, the really high brand names, even they have the occasional bodge wire. But this is a little bit, you know, a whole transistor, you don't often get that, you know. Hmm. Now some other things I've noticed here, let me just move around a bit. Um, on the plus side, let me, oh, sorry, camera's not on the, <laughs> didn't tighten that up. On the plus side, I'll just focus this so we get a better view of it. Ooh, can I get it focused? Yeah, hopefully. Um, things like this. This is an adjustable trimmer resistor, and they've put some silicon on there so it's not going to move around in the breeze on the little screw. That's a good touch. That's important. That's really useful. But something I see here which is not so good, let's just go over here. I'll go to autofocus. That might help. Save me twiddling all the knobs. Um, here we've got a big heat sink. See that heat sink? These things get hot. Okay, heat sinks get hot, that's why they are heat sinks. But down here, right next to it, we've got a little capacitor. And it's a no-name capacitor, and it's not rated to 105 degrees C. Now what normally happens is if you need to use a capacitor in an environment where it's going to get warm, you use a high temperature capacitor. They're rated to 105, sometimes even 125 degrees Celsius, which means that they don't get affected by this great big hot heat sink beside them. And you use a brand name capacitor. Chinese no-name capacitors, capacitors are notorious for failing. They dry out and they just pack up. They're just useless. So to use a no-name, non-temp spec capacitor right next to a heatsink is not a good idea. But hey, wait, there's more. Here's the other side of that big heatsink. And look, there's an even bigger capacitor here. Again, it's a mixture of good and bad. They've used some silicon here to stop it from moving around because big capacitors and a through-hole board, they've only held on by two wires. So if you don't glue them down, Vibration means those wires can fracture and then everything goes to hell in a handbasket. So they've, they've, they've snotted it down, which is really good, but it's still a no-name cap with no temperature rating beside a great big hot heatsink. It's just silly, just silly. And while I've got my bitchy hat on, um, look at this, they're using daughter boards. Now, a daughter board is a board that plugs into the main board or is soldered in to the main board. It's usually used where you've forgotten something or you didn't have room on the main board or you want to produce a piece of functionality that needs to be changed in ongoing revisions of the product. So we've got a couple of daughter boards here. Here's one, here's the other one. Now, again, look, this is a heat sunk component on a heat, heat, a heat sink, which means it's got a bit of weight behind it, a bit of heft, but there's no support for that board. Now they've siliconed down transistors so they won't vibrate loose, but this board, if this welder was sitting on a bench where perhaps there was a, a, a grinder that caused the bench to vibrate, it would only be a short matter of time before this board vibrated to the extent that the little leads that hold it to the main board fractured and it would fall off in there and probably smoke would come out. Bad design. And this one here, it's not supported either, but it's not quite as heavy, fortunately. Mm, you know, come on guys. Right, they've made extensive use of these little plugs for the connectors, but look, this is the kind of thing that worries you, but look at the angle of that. I mean, this lead here is so, obviously when they've put it in, it's been a bit short and they've just yanked on it, bent that over. Oh, you know, it's just not, it's not good. It's not a good look really, but no, I guess it doesn't matter too much. Okay, so we've pretty much determined that the main board is, is a bit how you go and it's a bit old fashioned, it's a bit old school, a bit outdated. There's some good aspects, there's some bad aspects. You know, really, um, you wouldn't want to buy a machine with all this many components on it today because the more there's, that's on the board, the more there is to fail. It's a simple logic. And uh, and so they've got these little connectors along the side here. These, this wire is just PVC. It's not very flexible. And again, you know, these things are exposed to vibration. A lot of things are carted around sometimes in the back of a truck. Vibration, vibration. This plastic here tends to provide uh, very little support. And if something gets a bit hot here, this plastic, yeah, it, it melts. It really does. Maybe it shouldn't get that hot, but sometimes crap happens. Now here's the power transformer. This transformer provides the power to drive all the drive circuitry and the uh, well, I'd say logic because it's mainly analog on there. It's a bit of C 4000 series CMOS logic. Um, this transformer provides all the power. But look how many tappings it's got. It's got a huge number of tappings. I don't know what's about a dozen or more tappings on here, different voltage outputs. And uh, not only does it do it in English, it does it in Chinese. So isn't that clever? It translates the voltage and the language at the same time. It's dated 2007, this transformer. So yeah, that's about the, the year this was built. Now down here, we've got the power switch. Um, power switch is on the back here. And it's a uh, double pole switch. And I mean, the power wiring is not too bad. They have used a sleeving on here, which is pretty good because this stuff is fireproof. It's kind of a glass sleeving, fiberglass sleeving. But the soldering's a bit how you go. And look at this, there's bits of bare wire. And down here, they've got this board, which all it has on it is a, is a MOV. That's to stop voltage spikes, damaging stuff. And it's just a place where they've soldered some wires on. This whole board here does nothing but act as a junction for these red wires, an earth point, and a place to put a MOV. That's not efficient. That's not efficient manufacturing design. It means obviously this was designed and built in a place where labor was really cheap and 
modern components were really expensive. I wouldn't be surprised if some of the bits in this were actually recycled um, because a lot of Chinese, this sort of manufacturing, they find it cheaper to use up all these old school components, these through hole components which are available for basically giveaway or they're pulled out of something that's, that's been recycled. They use those because that's their major cost. Labor's nothing, it doesn't cost very much at all. And when you look at the skill that's been used in building this thing, you realize that the labor involved isn't even that skilled. So it, it could be some school kids, you know, or child, uh, school aged children who aren't in school, um, playing around with hot bits of metal. They've done the work on this thing, because some places it's pretty damn rough. And here's the side view. Um, well, as I say, I won't go through the theory of operation too much, but suffice to say that down here, we've got some switching devices, which chop up the mains voltage and whack it into a transformer. It's a bit like any power supply. This is the inverter side of things. This inverter side of things, they just take the 230 volts or yeah, 110 volts from your mains, chop it up, whack it into a transformer so that it can be sucked out on the other side at a much higher current and then used to weld stuff. So basically, it's, it's, there's not really too much to complain about, I suppose. It doesn't look pretty, but that doesn't mean it won't work. There are things which <laughs> I kind of laugh at. For example, um, circuit board, the copper clad circuit board has a fairly thin layer of copper so it doesn't carry too much current. <laughs> what they've done here is they've left a bit of the solder mask exposed and then they've run some solder along here. Now <laughs> the thing is that solder is quite high resistance compared to copper and although this is a, a, well, a well approved method of increasing the current, current carrying capabilities of your circuit board, they've put such a small track of solder on here that really probably isn't going to make a snot of difference. Really it's not going to make any difference at all to the ability of this piece of copper to carry current. It's a bit of a joke really. I mean it looks good but it ain't really doing too much. You, they should have made a much wider track and used more solder to reduce that resistance or just used a bigger thicker board to start with. That would have been a good idea. And then we come down here now we've got obviously some transistor or switching devices. They're probably FETs. I'm not sure. I haven't even checked them. Some diodes here to basically to protect from voltages that occur when, a, uh, when it stops switching because although there's some built into the FETs they're usually not really big enough to handle heavy loads like this. Some heavy duty power resistors there and then come down here and you can see there's some wires that go over. And again they put some silicon on here but it's pretty much missed the mark on this one. This, it's supposed to support the wires but really it's mm, oh, marginal. It's pretty marginal but it does say pass so it must be good because it's passed so there can't be anything wrong with that. Um, yeah on the other side of this board there'll be more stuff. There'll be some filter capacitors. In fact just behind here, uh, I'll just move the camera a bit, over here, you can see there's obviously one, two, or one, two, three, four big filter capacitors. And one thing I do like, thumbs up to the Chinese, they put bleed resistors. These resistors here are designed to discharge those capacitors so that once you turn it off, there's not going to be those dangerous voltages I talked about lurking inside, which could sneak up and kill you if you accidentally went, oh, like that. So there you go. That's a good thing. As I say, this is such a, a mix of good and bad. It's, it's, it's like it was, you know, two a Jekyll and Hyde welder. Really, honestly, it is. So let's take a look up here. What have we got here? This is another board. Uh, it's looks. It's got some bridge rectifiers here and some capacitors filtering. It's probably some kind of voltage regulators for the top logic board, I would say. Looking roughly at that, but hard to tell. Uh, if we go down a bit further, there's some interesting stuff, though. Right, here's some cool and interesting stuff. If you ever worked on old televisions with the cathode ray tube, you recognize this. This is a high voltage transformer. What it does, it takes a very low voltage and turns it into a huge high, a high tension voltage, which is typically tens of thousands of volts. So why would you want tens of, tens of thousands of volts inside a welder? Well, this welder has what is called HF start. In the old days of welders, you had to strike an arc. So you'd actually just bring the, the welding tip to the metal and scratch it to get an arc going or actually just rest it on it and lift it off and then an arc would start because the voltage we use in TIG welding is actually quite low. It's not enough to create an arc on its own. It has to start over a very small gap and once the arc starts the ionized gas, usually argon, conducts electricity so you can draw a very long arc with quite low voltage once you get the arc flowing. Unfortunately you've got to get the arc flowing in the first place so they decided why don't we just whack some ultra high voltage, tens of thousands of volts, onto the feed that goes to your TIG torch and then that will create the arc without you having to contaminate your electrode by touching the metal. So this is HF start. So what they have up here is a board that generates a kind of a pulse. That pulse goes through the transformer. Then the wire out here has, carries the high voltage. It goes up here somewhere and then it's introduced into the uh, feed on the positive side over the other side of the welder. So this board just creates a high, tens high, ten high tension, high voltage stream. Um, Early ones used what they call a shower of sparks. It had some vibrator, a little vibrator and little electrodes buzzed to create the necessary um, intermittent voltage that was then stepped up by the transformer. This looks like it's solid state because there are some transistors and other bits and pieces in there. Interesting stuff. Now, 
Some other stuff you can see down here, which uh, we've got a bus bar here, copper bus bar. Now it's got two um, connections on it. I'm not too sure about this. Sometimes that's used as a current shunt to measure the current because if you have two connections, then the voltage difference between there and there, even though this is a really good conductor, when you're carrying 200 amps, there will be a measurable voltage across here. It's not that, I'm not sure that's what they've done here. I'll have to have a closer look later on. And there are, well, here we go, this might be the current shunt part here because this is a movable piece and it carries some wires back up to the top board. So yeah, I'd say that this is where the current shunt is done. It's done by measuring the voltage between here and here. And that's why there's a hole in there to make this slightly higher resistance so that there's more voltage drops across this piece of the bus bar than would normally drop. Because you need, to, when you measure current, you actually measure voltage. Because as we know, the more current that flows through a device, the more voltage appears across it. So as the current flows through this copper strap, because we've got a hole here, there's going to be a more voltage drop. And this hole would have been drilled to ca help calibrate this thing. Obviously, there's a standard size hole, and then they just slide this backwards and forwards to get the calibration right. Pretty simple stuff. Um, it's serviceable. I don't see anything wrong with that. It's not too bad. One thing I did notice, um, which I'm not sure I can get a camera angle on it, which is really bad. And again, it's good and bad in this damn thing. I just, I'm absolutely gobsmacked at the differences in, in good and bad. Now, I'm going to have to play around with camera angles and lights here. So let's just... Um, See if I can. Here we go. I'll go to manual focus, try and get this in focus because it's really important. Uh, let's see, here we go. Um, camera up a little bit, and there we go. Now, what I'm looking at is the gray, and right in the back here, there is a green wire and a kind of a gray wire. I don't know if you can see them over there. <laughs> this is bad. Now, these are running right over the top of a large, I'll come around the other side, a large wire wound resistor. <laughs> It's just terrible. See these green things in the back? I shall focus on those if I can. There we go. These green tubular things here are high-powered resistors. Now, they get hot. That's why they're mounted on this heat sink here. They get really hot. So running a PVC wire over one of these high-powered resistors, that's not good. That's a bad design choice because that plastic can melt and then the wire inside the insulated wire can touch on there. And if there's any imperfections in the ceramic coating on there, then bam, you've got a short circuit. You've got big trouble on your hands. Mm, as I say, good and bad all around on this thing. Now, welcome to the industrial strength side of this TIG welder. This is where some really interesting stuff happens. We've got these things here are called IGBT transistors. These are just large electronic switches that can switch the current off and on. And by, um, they're obviously heat synced on here. They can control the current that's flowing through your welder. So where you've got a current control, this is, these are the devices that control that current flow. So if these bugger up, then nothing comes out. So yeah, they're pretty expensive too. Uh, hopefully those haven't gone in this particular welder. You can tell the high current because look at the size of the straps here. There's these copper straps here, and there's these huge straps here which go over to this board. I'm going to take a closer look at that board because this is really bodge. Now this board is basically where we connect up our IGBTs to the output. Now this transformer, uh, I'll just go down a bit, show you the transformer. There's the transformer. Remember I said on the other side there was an inverter that chopped up the, the mains voltage and fed it into here so that we could get a much lower voltage but much higher current coming out. In fact, the secondary winding of this transformer consists of these copper straps, which are then soldered up here to these large pads on the circuit board. So these are the copper straps that make up the secondary of the transformer from the inverter. Now, it's really interesting to see here that they've used pretty much looks like standard copper board, standard fiberglass copper board. But of course, standard copper board only has a very thin layer of copper, so it can't carry much current. I mentioned on the other side that we had that sort of thin silver layer of solder that they'd put onto the circuit board to give it a bit more current, current carrying capabilities. Well, <laughs> look at this, will you? Oh, this, I'm going to have to get a macro shot of this because this is incredible. Okay, now this is where the copper strap joins on. You can see that. And if we go up here, just look, you can tell by the the contour, the curve here on the edge of the board, just how much solder they've poured onto this thing. Heaps of it. And, and even worse, when you solder something, of course, most of the, well, you use solder with a rosin core flux. And the rosin core flux leaves behind a residue, which is rosin. In fact, I can see a bit they've left behind down here, and I'll show you what I mean. This, this is rosin. This is out of the solder. So this stuff is kind of crystalline. You can scrape it off with a screwdriver if you try hard. So what they've done is they've gone over this thing. I shall pull out now so you can see. They've gone over this thing and, and scratched off all the rosin which would have been sitting over these fiberglass areas here between the things. They've scratched it off with a screwdriver and scratched the shit out of the solder at the same time. Now, it's not going to affect the operation, but it looks so crude, so bodged. Someone's got in there. One of some little Chinese man's job has been to scratch all the rosin off that board, and he's done it by Jingo's. So, mm, yeah. Um, another problem when you do this is um, the fiberglass boards are designed to take a certain amount of heat, but not 
too much. So where they've soldered this great big thick cable on here, they've had to use an enormous amount of heat. And it can damage the board itself. It doesn't happen often, but if someone without much skill or using the wrong gear tries to do it, you can really damage the board. Now on the back here, see all these devices along the top? I'll just go up a bit so you can hopefully see those. There's a massive row of devices along here. I think these are um, diodes, because we, if we look carefully, uh, probably three pin devices. There's one pin, there's another pin, there's the other pin. So we've got two pins joined together and another pin. So they're a two terminal device. It's got to be a diode. And that'll be clamping the voltage coming out of this transformer so that uh, we don't get nasty voltage spikes that, we, that you can get. Because there is no capacitor, there's no filtering, there's no smoothing on the output of this inverter that, that, uh, that I can see. So it's basically just rough as gut stuff. And you need to make sure there's no big spikes that are going to come over and damage your very valuable IGBT transistors over here. So yeah, that's, uh, and then there's some little capacitors down here which um, are designed to further help suppress the spikes. Um, yeah, that's basically what we've got here. But there's some interesting stuff, more interesting stuff down the bottom that we'll look at here. Um, because, oops, excuse me while I move my camera over. Let's just go out a little bit here. Now this is an interesting bit of stuff here. Um, I'm still not too sure what they've done here. Um, obviously the, the voltage, or the current I should say, comes in through these red wires here. There's a, there's a sense wire here. This voltage wire here must go off to something that senses the voltage. So it only needs to be fairly lightweight. Bolt it onto this copper bus. And this copper bus is then wound around there. And then it goes out to the terminal on the front of the welder. Now, they've run some wires here across. And then they've run them through there for some reason. The, they've put turns of wire in there. So this is acting like a transformer. It is basically um, probably in the AC mode or something. It may be picking up a pulse and feeding it back into the circuitry to control that pulse, probably the pulse width or something, I'm not too sure. Honestly, I really don't know on that one. I'd have to do some research. But again, look, we've got a little board in here. Tiny little board stuck away in there. Everything has got its own little board, and it really makes servicing and, and things quite a bit more difficult. So, yeah, and there is another set of drivers down here. These will be the IGBT drivers. These drive these bigger devices here for switching off and on, or controlling the current that's flowing through the whole thing. So, yeah, in... I told you I wouldn't tell you how they worked. <laughs> I guess I've done a crap job of not telling you because I've explained a reasonable amount of how these things work and what the different bits do. But obviously finding faults in something like this is a case of being methodical and stepping through. But you've got to be careful because there's some big voltages in here, some huge currents in here. And if it's something in the control board, it can be really hard to nail down because so much of it is interdependent. Is it a sense problem? Is it a... Uh, a control problem, you know, it could be so many different factors, it could be something, and there's so many, on this design, on this construction of this welder, there are so many bits hidden away that you just don't even know they're there until you look. Um, for example, let's have a look underneath the heatsink. Now I'm having to crank the exposure up here so hopefully you can see, because it's quite dark in there. See all those capacitors underneath the, the heatsink there, those blue capacitors, I mean they're stuck away under there and honestly they're so bodge. When you look at the lead length on some of these capacitors, this is awful. It's like they didn't have enough room, so they've just run a whole lot out there to I'll just move over a bit so get that in the center of frame. They've um, obviously, I'll try and zoom in a bit if I can. Am I going to go in? Yes, there we go. So that, that's a dog's breakfast. And uh, I'll just go back to auto exposure. It's a dog's breakfast. Look at, look at this. This is unbelievable. It's like they didn't have the right components, so they just wadged a whole lot of others in there. This is really, really sad and tragic. Oh, and I just noticed something else too. Let's look over here. Look at this. Look, a diode and a resistor joined together. It's another bodge. It's another bloody bodge setup. It's crap. And as I was saying, there's little boards everywhere. Look at this. Here we go. Here's another little circuit board I didn't notice before. It's got a relay on it and a connector and a transistor and a couple of passives. Why? Why, why couldn't they? I mean, what the hell is going on? Yeah, but um, all that aside, look at the back. It's got a lovely fan. Oh, that fan's beautiful. Love that fan. Jeez, one of my big, this is one of my biggest fans. Brilliant. Um, so yeah, the fan works. I know that. Um, in all, I'd have to say that this, I think I paid about $1,800 for this welder. It really is, yeah, I don't think I would have designed or built it this way, to be honest. But hey, um, I'm not living in China. I'm not getting paid next to nothing. And uh, I'm not trying to re reuse a whole lot of components that fell off the back of a truck or which were pulled out of a television three years ago or 10 years ago. So yeah, there we go. So that's it. That's a quick teardown of this welder, my thoughts on its design and construction. And I don't know if that's the sort of thing you want to see on XJet in coming months, but if you do, let me know. I mean, I may have a go at fixing this. It's, uh, it's probably quite fixable. It just takes a bit of wading through and working out what's going on. And so I, there are bits and pieces in here that I need to research as well because I've never worked on a 
TIG welder before. So um, if anyone's interested, just say, I'll put it on the queue of things to do. And if no one's interested, then one of the things that's going to be coming up on the Institute channel is going to blow a lot of shit up. I'm going to really blow a lot of stuff up because it's fun to blow stuff up. We're going to look at the um, theory and the science behind explosions because there's really cool stuff like the difference between detonation and deflagration. And we need things to test that kind of practice, that, that theory out on. So this would be a lovely thing to blow up. So stay tuned for that. You never know what's going to happen on next year. Thank you very much for watching this. And if you've got questions, comments, stick them in the bit below the video where such things are encouraged by YouTube. In the meantime, I should put the covers back on, stick it back out in the workshop, and I'll go back to doing my other stuff for the time being. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.